Welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all here on a warm winter day. We only have a few of these left, so it's good to see you here. Uh, today is the uh, last uh, landscape architecture lecture for the semester, and we're very, very pleased to have Andrew Tenbring with us. Um, he came in from New York, uh, where he works with James Corner Field Operations, and he is currently on a project um, that was a very highly coveted and competitive uh, project to do the waterfront for Seattle. He's the project designer for that project. He's also worked uh, for, as a designer for the recently opened Uptown Plaza in Cleveland. Um, he holds a master's degree from Harvard GSD and a uh, bachelor's degree from Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> from Purdue. <laughs> we'll forgive him. Uh, and uh, Andrew was uh, selected as the winner of the 2012 International Garden Festival in uh, Grand Métis, Quebec, and was awarded first place in the Catalyst. So in, uh, in and around his day job working at field operations, he enters a lot of competitions and in fact was just selected as one of the 50 finalists in an up-and-coming uh, landscape architecture installation project converting Market Street in San Francisco to a series of installations. Um, I think um, Andrew struck me over the last couple of, uh, well, last couple of hours as a very uh, warm and imaginative person who uh, is very uh, student sensitive. Um, he gave a wonderful lecture this morning on his own thesis at Harvard sharing it with the uh, landscape architecture students um, to give them a leg up on how they can bring these massive projects to completion. So please help me in welcoming Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me in. And thank you to the College of Architecture and Planning for having me. Um, so a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, Simon, uh, asked if I would come and, and talk to you about a few things. And I said, well, what things? And so it, he said, well, figure it out. What do you want to talk about? And so as, as I was thinking about that a little bit more, I was thinking about this thread that's really run through a lot of the work that we do at field operations and a lot of the work that we do at Atlas Lab, which is a research and design lab that a partner and I run. And that is this idea of staging grounds. And it's a really simple idea. It's an idea that landscape can and should perform in a variety of different ways. It's not a static element, but it's something that can change and it can adapt through time. And in that sense, it is a landscape that, that has a future. It has many futures. It has a variety of futures. And that's where you get the, the title up there. So as, as Jody mentioned, um, we, outside of the office, I do a number of different uh, competitions and research, research agendas through this group called the Atlas Lab. And the group consists of me and a friend it's a small group, but we work together and we find different competitions that we're interested in and different research projects that we're interested in. But today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we've done at field operations. And uh, this is, a, this is a, a great image of the city. I like it for a few reasons. And one is that oops, there's a lot going on in it. You have the, the active waterfront here with uh, ships coming in, cargo coming in. You have big roadways, a lot of roadway infrastructure. You have you see just a little bit, the High Line Park poking through there, going through the city. Then you can see way in the back our office right there. That's why I like it the most. Um, so what I, what I want to do first is just talk about um, a few of the projects that we've been involved with recently in the office. And, um, and that really over the last five years, five to ten years, we've been really fortunate to be involved with a number of pretty high level, um, high exposure public projects that um, I, think, I think are pretty interesting. There's the High Line in New York, there's Tongva Park in Santa Monica that, that recently just opened and we were very excited about. There's Ray Street Pier in Philadelphia, Shelby Farms Park in Memphis, so we're moving out of the coasts a little bit, which is nice. Uh, this Muscoda Marsh project in New York City 
and uh, a, a plaza in, uh, in Miami. And so in New York specifically, where our office is based, we're, we're A, just really fortunate to be there because there's so much going on in the waterfront right now. And in the park system right now, there's um, just a, a huge variety of different types of um, really, uh, really uh, magnificent investments in public open space there. And a lot of these projects, some of these projects we're involved with, a lot of them we're not involved with. And so just to give you sort of a taste of some of these, there's um, the Domino Waterfront, and this is, it's not being constructed yet, but it's a new stretch of waterfront in Brooklyn. There is uh, Hunters Point Park, which is a fantastic park, um, primarily designed by Reese and Freddie, I believe. Uh, there's Governor's Island, which you, uh, you may have read a little bit about by West 8. And there's Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, not too far from where I live, that was done by MBVA. And so what we've seen in the last decade is really this is tremendous investment in cities. And it begs a little bit of the question why. And, and when you look at how people are moving and where they're moving, you just see this, this pretty significant migration towards urban centers. So this is uh, data from, I believe, 2012. And it just shows the, the amount of urban migration, where uh, the amount of growth cities are seeing right now. And it's significant. A lot of people, a lot of young people like you, uh, like me, uh, move to urban centers, whether that's a, a big urban center like New York or LA, or whether that's other urban centers like Indianapolis, Chicago, um, and others. And so the way that cities are dealing with this is through just an enormous amount of new construction. A lot of the centers around housing, residential, and commercial uh, uh, mixed use development. And, and what we're finding is, is that as we build that, and as younger people move there, it's not enough for them just to have a place to live. It's not just enough for them to have a small apartment in a great city, but they want to have a place to play, a place to be outside. And so what, what we're seeing happening more and more is with these, with these new urban development projects is a tremendous investment um, in both new infrastructure and new open space. And this is actually a, a really recent image of construction on the High Line. You can see the, the buildings that are going up all around it. But there's also been this tremendous investment in the, in the public open space. And um, the good news for us is that there's a huge amount of investment in public open space, which means that landscape architecture firms are getting jobs, architecture firms are getting jobs. And the way that cities we're finding are able, to, um, able, able and willing to fund this is not only through public investment, which had been a, um, a pretty prevalent model in the past, but what we're seeing now is that they're partnering with private entities, whether it's nonprofit organizations, developers, to come together to raise money to build these really uh, significant and impactful um, urban development areas that include a significant amount of public open space. And just to give you sort of a sense of some of these numbers, I'll just run through a few projects that um, we've been involved with and other firms have worked on. Sa uh, Santa Monica and Tongva Park, it's about a $42 million project. Hunters Point, 66. Chicago's Navy Pier, this is a, a new number I just got today, 230. Uh, Shelby Farms Park, 240. The High Line, 273, half of which was structural and mitigation, so not that bad. Uh, and Brooklyn Bridge Park, it, you know, a huge, fantastic park. It's 355. It's a lot of money. And then there's the Seattle waterfront that I'll talk to you about more in a bit, and that's, that gets to the Bs. We're in, we're in a billion. And so, the, you know, how, how does this happen? How do cities partner with these people? And I want to give you a little bit of a sort of case study with the High Line, because that's, um, it's A, fairly well known, and B, they, the, the nonprofit organization, the Friends of the High Line, which is the, uh, one of the, the private entities that we've worked with, is uh, hugely successful and a great model. And so the Friends was, was formed really by these two guys, Joshua David and Robert Hammond, and they met at a community board meeting. And the community board meeting was discussing whether to uh, save this railway, this elevated railway that went through New York. And some people were saying, no, like we, we need to tear it down, we need to get rid of it. And they were saying, no, it's actually really cool, and we see a lot of potential in it. And we see a potential for it to become this new greenway that moves through the city. And they got together and they started this nonprofit organization and they talked to other people, and especially other people with money. And they said, you know, like, can we raise some money to do this? Can we get some funds together to help transform this area that was dominated by uh, 
really single-use infrastructure into something that was um, open to the public and able to um, be more useful. And so that's what we did. We've been involved with this project for a number of years now, and the, the concept really was just to take a park and put it up on the structure. So a lot of the structure's been saved, and it's a place where people can really move through the city in a way that they haven't been able to move before. And it's actually quite long. I think it's a, it's a little under a mile and a half. It's like 1.4 miles. And it stretches from around, um, around 32nd Street down to 14th Street. And so it, it's really it's connecting these neighborhoods in a way that, that hasn't existed before. And so just to give you a little bit of a, a breakdown on some of these numbers, really, you know, the, the city really kicked in a lot for this. But the city also has quite a bit to gain from it, from uh, tax base and, and, and uh, other revenues like that. Federal government was also a significant player, but the, the Friends, they, they did a pretty good job. They raised $60 million for it. And a lot of that money goes towards maintenance and operations. And so while the, the city, state, and federal are kicking in money to, to really help get it constructed, the Friends are really interested in making sure that it lives, and that it has a long life. It's not something that gets built and is pretty during opening day, but can last. And that's really, really important. And so the, one of the reasons that we've seen, in the case of the High Line, at least, that cities are willing to do this is the economic impact of it. And if we look at you know, what, what, has, what has the High Line caused and what has really that, that vision caused, there's been over $2 billion in private investment. There's 29 major uh, development projects, a bunch of new construction jobs, neighborhood jobs, should be uh, different uh, uh, restaurants, bars, things like that. New, a bunch of new resident, very expensive new residential units, new hotel rooms, and, and office space. And so you see the, the 150 million um, being put into it, but the city is really gaining a lot from that. That the revenue over, uh, this is forecasted over uh, 20 years, actually, uh, it's a pretty good deal. It's also a big attraction. And so the, this information, I think, is, is pretty cool. We're really proud of it, and I'm really proud of it that we're doing better than the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hugely popular, and it's not a surprise. You know, People love open space, and people love open space in cities. It's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an attractor throughout the seasons. Um, there's a little bit of drop off in the fall and winter, but people still go there. It's still an interesting place to be. It's dynamic. It's a landscape that changes, and we want people to experience that. And the people that experience it, are, they're varied, too. There's a lot of people that are there for tourism. Right? There's people that are you know, visiting on vacation, and they're taking photos, and they're to see and be seen. But also in, in uh, urban environments like New York, people use open space in uh, a little bit of a different way than in other cities. And because we all live in these tiny little apartments, we don't have backyards or front porches or really anywhere to get outside besides the parks. And so this is actually where people live out their lives. It's where they read the newspaper, they do morning yoga, they have dinners, and, and meet up. And so it, when, we, when we look at uh, projects like this, I think that it, it is, um, it's a good example of the way that these spaces can be, A, increasingly impactful to the public, and be really useful to the city. It's a good deal for the city. It helps them grow. And so this is our office here. I think maybe a couple of you have been here before. It might have been an office tour. Um, it might have been before my time. Um, and what I wanted to do today, this is getting to the meat of it, uh, is really talk to you about a few ways that um, I think both our office and in uh, my own work, we think about projects like these these types of large-scale, um, big investment type projects. And that's really in three categories. One is um, what I'll call imagining futures. And that's really about, it's really about public process and understanding what the public wants and needs and helping to even direct that a bit. There's this idea of projecting futures, and that's really about drawing and representation and how even that can also guide and direct what the public wants and needs. And then there is staging futures, um, and that's really about developing a design whose program can adapt, it can change as the city changes, it can change as uh, people's wants change in there. They made it really easy because they all have future in them, so easy to remember. Uh, so imagining futures. Um, I'm going to give three examples of this, and it, it's three examples of public process. And um, I think 
through this, you'll be able to see how much fun we have with the public process. It's really a, it's an exciting part for us. It's also a really important part of what we do. Um, this is an example of Shelby Farms Park in Memphis where really from the get-go we understood that our client was the kids. Those were the users. Those were the people that were there the most. They were there and they were outdoors and, in, and going to enjoy the space. They were there with their families. And so one of the first things that we did is we uh, got a, a busload of kids and we took them out to the site, which was, uh, there were a few small playgrounds there, but it was mostly woods and creeks and things like that. And we just watched how they play. We watched how they were you know, interacting with the vegetation and you know, scrambling by the water to pick stuff up, playing with, the, um, uh, with the, the different things that they found there. And so we took them back and we asked them just you know, based on what they were doing, could you just like draw, draw your playground, draw, draw a place you want to be? And so we gave them you know, paints and pastels and paper. And what they came up with was, it was actually you know, it was pretty simple. There are places to run, circuits to run around, things to climb on, things to hang off of. And so as the, as the design developed, we really um, tried to mimic what they drew. And another, another aspect that we, um, we involved the public with was, uh, so it's Shelby Farms Park, so it was, a, uh, it was a farm. It was an agriculture area. A lot of the trees were removed from that, and so a part of our vision for that site was a reforestation. And so as part of that reforestation, we brought the trees to the site, and then we asked the public to come and help us plant them. And so they were involved in this operation and this investment of being a part of the, the reforestation of, of this area. It, it, was, it was their area. It was their forest. And then we brought the kids back for the groundbreaking, so they were involved with the, um, you know, with the, the beginning of the construction um, a bit. And so you know, the design that came out of that really responded to a lot of what they were asking for. There were circuits to run around, places to climb on and hide in. There were, um, there were th towers to climb up, there were uh, nets to hang on, there was this sort of interaction with the vegetation that they could have, a story tree that they could you know, bring, uh, bring small classes to. The next project is, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a project in Santa Monica, I've shown you now a couple times. And it also went through a pretty extensive um, public process. Um, the first thing that we did is that when we went there, we partnered with this, uh, with a news organization, and we interviewed a lot of people. We interviewed them on video, and so we could keep that information, and we could see what they were saying, and we asked them a series of questions about um, what do you want to do in your park, where do you want to be most in your park, and then we, we had some ideas of program that we showed them, and what types of things um, we thought that they might like to do, and then they looked at that, and they wrote notes and said, you know, no, I hate this idea, or yes, I love it, or you know, have, have you thought about this? And then we took that information and we, we saw what they said. And we said that you know, a lot of people really want places for picnicking, lounging, sitting, you know, typical park activities. But we also are really interested in this idea of horticulture and display gardens and also a venue for public art. Right? And so in one sense, our interaction with them was, um, uh, was very personal. Right? We, were, we were engaging with them. We were becoming, trying to become a part of their community, but then we also wanted to extract some of that data and really see what you know, the aggregate of that was saying and how we could respond to it. And then after we, after we got that, we went back and we were really interested where people wanted to be on the site. Uh, what was the most interesting part of the site? And so we gave them these little orange bags. And we asked them, we gave each person two, and we asked them to go on the site and put it at your two most favorite places. And so there were places that we, we really didn't expect. You know, some of them were near trees that they thought you know, were really special to the site. A lot of the trees that they marked we ended up saving. Um, and some areas were totally unexpected. But they were interesting. You know, it actually reflected what they were saying. There were um, these gardens that existed on the site were really important to them. These views out. You can see the little kid climbing up on the hill. And so that, that helped give us cues also. And what came out of that was a design that really tried to respond to that. It was a design that allowed people to, to lounge and sit and picnic, but also brought them up for these great views out to the bay, uh, out, to the, out to the ocean. And there were also, a, 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 something that's really special about this park is the, uh, is the planting and the horticulture. That was something that we brought in a variety of experts to really help us create a really special planting environment for that. Okay, 
And the, the, the last example I'll give is the, the Seattle waterfront. I'm actually going to keep this section a little bit short because I'll go into it in depth a little bit more. But uh, Seattle has been a project that I've been involved with for a number of years, about four years now. And it has had the most extensive public process that I've ever been a part of. This is a list just from 2002, uh, 2012 to 2013 of all the public events that we were involved with. There's others from 2010 to 2012 and 2013 to today. And so they've um, asked us to be a part of all of these community engagement projects where we have asked them questions, we have shown them ideas, we have um, brought them out to the site, left, uh, and asking them to, you know, Talk, talk to us about the site. Tell us what you think is most interesting. We've also um, created these little activities for them to do. We had ping pong tables made and brought it out to the waterfront. And what we're really trying to get at is this question of what makes a great waterfront. You know, you, we're, we're from New York, you know, so you have to tell us what, what, what makes a great waterfront in Seattle. And so we've done this in a few different ways from creating different apps where people can you know, leave comments and things like that, to just doing really simple uh, things like painting a pier and putting chairs out there for people to get more excited about coming out to the water. We've also created boards where uh, we show them ideas of different um, types of things that can happen on the waterfront and ask them to, again, tell us what you think. Okay, so this is gonna build on each other um, a little bit. So we, we talked about public process, and a lot of that has to do with A, listening, and be showing. Right? So we, we're hearing what you're saying, and then we are developing something and showing it to you. And the way that we develop a lot of those drawings is, um, uh, I think, is pretty interesting. And a lot of that is to do uh, a few things. One is to create excitement about it. And so if you look at a lot of uh, the drawings that our office produces, um, they're very exciting, whether you like it or not. They're very saturated. There's a lot of energy in them. And that is, um, it's very intentional to create a sort of um, excitement about what, what, could ha what could happen there, the potential for it. And the other is to show a variety of different types of program. And I want to go through a few of those um, examples. Um, and all of, these, all of these drawings that I'll show you are drawings that we've shown the public and we're using to really try to communicate what we're, what we're trying to achieve. Um, this is an example from Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in London. Um, and the, the, the point of the series of drawings is really just to show how a pretty, pretty simple design intervention, there's a hedgerow, right, and some tiered seating that's next to a promenade, right? So on an average day, a weekday, it might be a place where people can come and they can, you know, eat their lunch. Maybe, maybe if they're lucky, there's a clown on stilts entertaining them. Um, but then maybe during the weekend or during festival events, it could be a place for um, different types of sculpture. It could be a place for outdoor markets uh, where it really a, a lot of people can fit here. So it can be a place where it's, it's really a nice environment when there's few people there, but it's also a nice environment when there's a lot of people there. Um, it could be also a place for a, uh, a sort of localized uh, group to gather, a place for you know, something like a concert, just like that. This is an example from Navy Pier in Chicago, which part of it is open so you can go see it the next time you go. Um, it's this idea of a fountain. It's a pretty simple idea that it's a fountain that can be turned on, there can be jets and a place for kids to play, uh, be with their families, it can even change form, it can maybe not just be water but also be a mist. But then uh, during the fall or during times where there's you know, market festivals and things like that, it also can become an amphitheater. It's a place where people can gather around, uh, erect tents around and really uh, be a, a different type of center than the fountain could be. So again, a, a landscape, uh, a place that can adapt. It can uh, be at once one thing and at another time another thing. It's adaptable. Right? And uh, with a lot of these projects, you've, they've showed you some of the budgets. Uh, there's this thing called percent for art. That means a percent of the money in the project goes towards public art. And so the, more, the larger the budget, the more money they have for art. And so art has become a really important uh, part of what we do, and uh, what we think about a lot is how um, a variety of different types of public art can change a space. So this is an, a, an example from a project that we did in Minneapolis, or we, we're currently working on in Minneapolis, um, showing a few different ideas that artists have come up with that, and how that will change the public realm. 
how it becomes a different idea. And so this is a communication tool for the public to help give them ideas and give them the sort of the, the potential for this area. Right? Another thing we like to talk about is times of the day and how um, a, a site can change from daytime to nighttime. Uh, there might be different types of users there. Uh, there might be different types of program. Um, but, but again, uh, trying, to, um, trying to give them the, the potential for projects like these. Uh, another thing, this is an example from Seattle. Um, another uh, thing that we think about in Seattle and coastal environments is the tide. And so at low tide, it could be one thing. And at high tide, it, it changes. It's a different type of environment. And so again, the, these types of images, we, we hope, try to get people excited about the potential of the area. There's also seasonal variation. And this is an example from Minneapolis. Um, Minneapolis is uh, uh, really nice in the summer. And it's really cold in the winter. And so, uh, but, but people like to be outside there. And so what we, what we have tried to do is show the way that uh, specific parts of the site can be used in the summer when it's nice, but also market time in the fall and even in the winter um, for ice skating rinks and things like that. So a lot of this has to do with, with program, the way sites are used, trying to help convince people that um, the design that we're working towards is really adaptable. It's something that can um, change. It's not a static landscape. Now we're on, well, we're already in Seattle. So we're at the last section. In this section, I want to give a little bit more of a full-throated conversation about um, our process of design. And I think that, I, I hope that this section will sort of knit together the past things that we've talked about. Um, Seattle, um, it's, a, it's a very large project. It's a project that where we have a variety of different clients. Uh, it's a project where we're partnered uh, with uh, a private entity called Friends of the Waterfront. And so it, it, I think that it, it's a really great example of um, a, uh, a robust private-public partnership, um, a, um, a really interesting example of the public process. And you'll see some of the representation, how that's translated into, into design. Um, I really like this image of the Seattle waterfront. It does a number of, uh, it shows a number of really interesting things. Um, if you haven't been to Seattle, this is the, the sort of the downtown core. It's the commercial core of the city. It's where all the high rises are. Um, and here's the waterfront. Right? There are a number of uh, private piers at commercial development. There's the aquarium down here. And there's the port that brings people from the ferries into the city. And since the 50s and 60s, this beautiful creature here has separated the downtown from the waterfront. And it's this two-story elevated highway. Right? So there's lots of noise. It's difficult to get under. Um, it's not a pleasant environment. And so um, one of the ways that this project had started is really back in 2001. And there was an earthquake in this area. It was the Miss Quali earthquake. And it did a number of damaging things to the city. And one of those things was structurally damage the viaduct. And so it's actually um, it's sort of temporarily safe to drive on. Cars drive on it now. But the um, the government made a decision to uh, figure out how to replace the capacity of it. They wanted to take it down and either rebuild it. They could try to accommodate all the traffic on a surface road, or they could build a tunnel. And um, we're all really happy that they decided to build a tunnel. Um, so the first part of the project is the viaduct. And so what's shown in white is the viaduct and, and that being removed. The second is the seawall. It was also structurally damaged. It was also very old. And so you can see the, um, the seawall crumbling away here. And so the second part of the project is the seawall replacement project. Right? And this diagram um, does a nice job of showing sort of some of the, the complicated um, uh, damages to the, the infrastructure, all to say that really what's important to replace is the viaduct and the seawall and, um, and to protect the utilities that are there. There's actually. Um, this is a, a sidebar a bit, but there are utilities there that are running contiguously from uh, North Washington down to Southern California on a power sharing thing. So those utilities are pretty, they're pretty important to protect. So just this is a, a, a map, a diagram um, highlighting some of these things. Um, in the aerial image, you saw this is the, uh, the ferry terminal here. This is the aquarium over here. And what's shown in blue is the extent of the seawall that's being replaced. Um, 
And uh, on the land side of that, we're also building a new roadway. And that roadway, it doesn't replace the capacity of the viaduct, but it allows circulation up and down the waterfront. And then in between the seawall and the roadway, is new public space, and that's what's shown in yellow there. Um, and that's the new waterfront project. So a little background on the project. Um, we have uh, four main clients. There's the Department of Transportation, roadway project. There's Department of Planning and Development, it's an urban design project. Department of Parks and Recreation, kind of a landscape project. And then there's this overseeing body called the Central Waterfront Committee, and they're, they're sort of shepherds of this project. And our role in it, James Corner Field Operations, is to really lead all things design related. Um, that involves uh, design aspects of the roadway. Um, it obviously involves urban design and landscape portions of the promenade, um, things like that. CH2M Hill is um, in charge of the technical team over there. Uh, and Shields Olblitz Johnson is in charge of project management. So they put, keep pushing everything forward to make sure that it happens. And then there's a pretty wide variety of consultant, uh, subconsultants. Some are contracted under us, some are under the other heads. Um, you can see here. These are just a few of them. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, there's our, our private friend, the Friends of the Waterfront. And um, Friends of the Waterfront has one really simple job. All they have to do is raise $100 million. So that's what they're working on, and they're doing great at it. So those are our technical clients, but like I, I talked about earlier with Shelby, there's actually a variety of other clients. There's the public, right? There's the people that we're actually building this for. And uh, when we got to Seattle, we realized that it's not just you know one public there. There's actually a variety of public. There's people that are really invested in the port. There's the shippers and builders. There's uh, the environmentalists, what we call the greens. There's tourists, the visitors. Um, there's the neighbors, so the people that, that live in the area. And really what we wanted to do through the public process is bring these guys together and ask them the question, what makes a great waterfront? And so to do that, we held a huge number, like I mentioned earlier, of public events who were um, extraordinarily well attended, um, for better or worse, which means we got lots and lots of comments, lots and lots of suggestions. Um, and at all of these events, we, we gave them uh, different materials to write on, we showed them ideas, and we, um, we asked them, again, you can, you can see up here, the, the question, what makes a great waterfront? That was the, the main question that we had. Um, at early stages, we showed them different ideas of program and different things that we think uh, could maybe happen. As the design developed a little bit more, we, um, we showed them more detailed drawings, we built models. And we asked them to respond to those and let us know what they, what they thought of them. Um, this was actually from our most recent public event. In this event, we went into the most detail. We showed them a lot of drawings about each little portion of the site and we asked them to respond to it and tell us what you think. Um, and the, um, one of the interesting things about doing sort of successive meetings like this is you can't go there and say, tell us what you think, and then never come back again. They're going to expect you to change because they've told you what they thought and they demand it. And so it's it's actually a way of um, uh, building trust for us. So you, yes, we actually are really interested in the things that you're saying, and we we want to respond to make this better. Um, so from this information, um, this is a graphic from one of our earlier um, meetings. We asked them again to you know where where do you most want to be on the waterfront? And we saw that a lot of these places, they were on the, they're on the water's edge, which is kind of a no-brainer. Um, but they're also at the, the ends of the pier. They're really as close as they can to the water. Um, you can see a lot of you know, big, big clusters at the piers here um, in between the slips at this open area here that will eventually become a beach um, into this pier here. And so we, we, we uh, took that as really good advice, and we, we really wanted to focus on those areas. And we asked them, what do you most want to do on the waterfront? We, we took that into advice, and we, we tried to um, amplify those types of programming activities. The other thing that we learned as outsiders to Seattle and to the West Coast was that Seattle really exists at this edge. Right? It's, it's the edge of the continent. It's, um, it's the edge between um, North America and the Pacific Rim. And, and the way that that is really manifested in Seattle is at least unique to me as a uh, person who lives in New York, is 
just these fantastically huge container ships that are moving in and out of the bay and are extremely visible on the waterfront. These you know five to ten story ships that are just coming in, and it's really it's it's a sight and it's a it's a huge presence on the waterfront that's really interesting. It exemplifies that industrial quality that I think is really um, it's unique to that area. It's also on the edge of the um, the ocean and the forest mountains and rivers on the on the mainland. And so what we get there is this really cool juxtaposition between the vastness of the bay and uh, uh, the ecology and the, uh, and the geography of the mountains that are, that are very visible in that area. It's also at the edge between the freshwater lakes of inland and the Puget Sound, which is brackish and salt water. And then inside, nestled inside Puget Sound is what's called Elliott Bay. And the, the city has really grown around Elliott Bay in this, in this kind of ring. Um, some of it has to do with boating activities, some of it has to do with habitat. There's just dramatic weather that moves across the bay, and there's all of the issues that cities have being on water bodies that come with um, pollution. And so one of the things that we really liked was this, this juxtaposition between the urban, the tough urban environment of the port and the city, at the same time being right next to this just fantastic, surreal, natural environment. And so. One of the things that, we, that came into our mind was this idea of the Bay Ring around Elliott Bay, that it's really this ring that encompasses all of these different types of activities from the, or places from the downtown to the port to these just very uh, visible and present um, features like Mount Rainier, the Olympic National Park, and that Cascades. And what we wanted to do was really reorient Seattle around this bay, around this ring. Right? And so um, we looked at it initially at three different scales. It was the scale of the city, and that was really about how can we reconnect this idea of the Bay Ring back into the city. There was the urban scale that was really about how does the waterfront change as it encounters different neighborhoods. Right? It's not one waterfront, but it's actually really it's connected to the neighborhoods they're associated with. And then there's the waterfront scale. Um, these are just a, a couple of diagrams that, that show those points. Uh, the city scale about recentering around the bay, these strategic connections. It has a lot to do with prioritizing different streets um, around the bay. The urban scale that really has to do with a framework plan and the waterfront responding to the different neighborhoods. That it's not, uh, it's not only one waterfront, but it's a series of waterfronts that move across the site as, they, as it intersects with the neighborhoods. And then there is the urban scale which is really about a series of journeys and places. And this is a, it's a diagram of the, the site, so everything in color is within our project area. You know. And the different colors just indicate different neighborhoods. Right? There's a neighborhood that is connected more to the stadiums called Railroad Way. There's a historic neighborhood called Pioneer Square, and so on and so on as you move up the site. And so um, what I would like to do is just first talk about, you know, it, this idea of program changing throughout the site, and not only throughout the site, but as the city develops, as this project develops, we can't know for certain exactly what will take off. And so we have to design in a way that is fairly adaptive, that can change as people's uses of the site changes. So I would like to show you all of these places, but I think we'll probably run late. So what I'm gonna do today is just show you two of the coolest, I think. There's the historic piers, which is really, it's about the promenade, um, this idea of a new uh, waterfront promenade. And then this area called the central public space, and this is really the sort of crown jewel of the project. Um, there are areas for elevated views, there's areas to get down into the water um, and really be a part of the bay. So if we start with the, the historic piers, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how this area is changing, this is an aerial that exists today. And you can see that there, existing sidewalk, it's, a, uh, it's about 20 feet at the most right now um, with some street trees. There's the viaduct, the existing viaduct running along there and an off ramp going back into the city. And once the viaduct's demolished, it's gonna open up a lot of land. And so the new roadway is actually gonna go in the footprint of the viaduct right now. And the public space will increase by five, It'll go from 20 feet to 100 feet. And then there'll be a sidewalk on the, on the east side. And so our, our idea was to really consolidate the public space on one side, on the water side, and try to give them as much access as possible to the piers and to the pier slips and the water. And so um, with this, I'll just talk about a few features of it that I, I think are, are interesting. 
And one is really um, the intersections. And the intersections is really the, where people are coming from the city, and it's where they're entering into the waterfront. They're actually they're entering into a new, almost neighborhood district. Uh, it's gonna have um, different design elements than the city has. It's gonna have a different feel than the city has, and we wanted to, um, we wanted to highlight that. We also, at the intersections, um, when we say intersection, we think a lot about vehicles and cars, but we wanted to think about these intersections um, on, on the promenade side as social intersections, where people are moving up and down the waterfront north-south, but they're also crossing east-west, and can these be places where people come together, they can have different types of social interactions and things like that. Um, and so this, um, this is a, it's sort of an aerial view and axonometric showing some of that where you can see um, a, a tree-lined street that's moving here. It's important to buffer the, the promenade from the street. Um, a crossing that's actually marked in a different type of pavement, so it cues to them that they, this is a place for pedestrians. It's a pedestrian-oriented intersection. And whoops, a little place, a place for people to gather. Now, uh, this image is it's slightly outdated. Uh, we've, in the past few months, we, uh, we brought on a new architect uh, called N Architects, and they're a firm based in New York, to take another look at these guys, because we thought they could be a little bit more interesting. Um, but the idea is that the, the, the kiosk is sort of the center and the heart around the social intersection where people can come to get information. They could come to get food. Um, and those uses could, could change out over time. And so what was central to this idea was that there would be a, a, a core shell, right? Uh, it's a structure that could be inhabited, but it was a place where things could be plugged in and pulled out. We call that plug and play. And it was a place that could be potentially used for equipment rental, food and drink, information. It could be opened up for art venues and things like that. And so as N Architects has been thinking about these, they actually took a, a very different approach, which we thought was pretty exciting. And their idea was, could we create these kiosks that actually reflected different parts of the city and different parts of the bay? And so that through, through this reflective uh, surface, it actually disappeared and it became a part of um, the city fabric in a way and a part of the bay in a way. That it also would have a sort of a life at night. So it, it existed uh, as, a, as a beacon and as an element both in the daytime and the nighttime. So uh, from, a, from a, a planting perspective, I think uh, the, uh, the, the planting in this area is probably the most interesting. We had this idea to create, um, A, just a, a very large planting area that separated the roadway from the public space, but we didn't want it just to be a sort of static environment, and we, we had this idea if we could create a variety of different um, uh, moisture environments, maybe some areas that are raised and are a little bit more dry, and some areas that were lower and could take in uh, stormwater from the promenade and filter that through, um, and also places where people could walk through so they could get a new experience with this type of planting. And a lot of this planting is um, uh, a chunk of it's native. Uh, a chunk of it is sort of pulled from different types of planting communities that are on the shoreline, um, and a chunk of them are new species. They're, they're not native species. You can see a few images of that here, with this, this generous planting area, boardwalks moving through it, um, big timber seeding lining the edge where people can, can gather and be close to the planting. But most importantly, a place where people can move through the planting. They can experience it in a way that they really haven't before, and typically in cities you don't get a, an opportunity to. And so, the paths here are very narrow, they're quieter spaces, they're slower spaces, um, spaces where people can come and get away a little bit from the, from the larger crowds. So the other really interesting thing about this project, and this has to do a bit with the seawall project, is this idea of the glass floor. And the glass floor is, uh, is there to really provide a new habitat for this important salmon corridor that's moving south to north in the site. So they annually migrate this way. It's actually a federally protected migration route. And one of the requirements was to allow more light down into the water. And so what we did is we, we thought of uh, creating this pavement that, was, uh, that allowed light down. It was pretty simple. And so we worked with a few engineers, a few aquatic engineers, ecologists, to determine what kind of light level would be appropriate for them, what's the most we could actually do from a structural standpoint. 
and we, uh, we developed this, this glass floor to respond. We also wanted to think a little bit about the seawall itself, and so we wanted the seawall to, um, it was urban, it was a constructed thing, but we wanted it to be a place where uh, different critters could attach to and it could create a little bit more of a, um, a nicer environment for their, our, our baby salmon friends. And we just got mock-ups a few days ago for them. We're really excited about these. And they installed the mock-ups not too long after that. So these are, this is in Seattle, and you can see them in there. They're massive, really big guys. Very excited. And so the, the point of this is really to create a, 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 a sort of urban habitat for this, uh, this important ecosystem there. So this is a, a, a nice little summary of some of these things. You can see the, the raised habitat areas that get the fish closer to the light. Uh, the, the glass floor here that lets the light down, promenade, planting, little cycle track here in the roadway. Okay, done with the promenade. Public, central public space. Um, it's the largest publicly owned area in Seattle. It has just a huge potential for really impactful interventions here. So this is the view of it today. Here the pink line shows the new project area. Uh, and what we wanted to do here is really create a series of rooms, a series of new and sort of exciting rooms where people can move through, experience the city, and experience the bay in a variety of different ways. Um, the first part of this is what we call Union Street Pier. Um, it's, a, it's a large uh, publicly owned pier. It looks out to the city, and we really wanted that pier to reflect a few different aspects of, of the bay and of the environment typical of Seattle. And so one of the things that we did was think about this water feature on the pier they could behave in a few different ways. In one instance, in the summertime, it could be um, A, turned on, and it could both reflect the sky and the city in a variety of different ways. There could be jets and fountains for kids and families to come into and play in, and this idea of a, a mist cloud, too, to create a, a few different types of environments for, for families. It looks something like this. So in the summertime, it could act as one, one way. Um, when there's other events, we wanted to be able to turn it off and let it just be an open pier for things like market events and festivals. Um, we wanted it to be able to be big enough to be sized appropriately for concerts on the pier and for different holiday events, things like that. So just north of the pier is an area that we call Aquarium Plaza. This is another big, big public institution. And one of the things that we uh, really were excited about was creating a sort of outdoor amphitheater for families and kids and school groups that are coming to the aquarium, not just a place for gathering, but also a place for outdoor classrooms, things like that. There could be, the aquarium could hold events there. We also wanted to create um, a, a type of sculpture that could be climbed on and played with. So there's this idea of some people likened to a fish, which we don't. Um, but this, this idea of a sculpture that can be played on, it's interactive. There are vines growing on it that can be climbed on. There's grind, vines grow, growing on it that can be um, looked at. So it's, a, it's not a playground, but it's a place for kids to play. Right? So just north of there is what we call Pier 6263. It's um, also owned by the city, and it's this huge pier that goes out to the water. And what we wanted to do was create these just really nice uh, sunset south-facing views there, so we, we created these seating steps. We also raised it up a bit, so you could get out to the end, and you could be on a little bit of a platform there. Right? And so this was also a space that we wanted to be very versatile. We wanted it to be open and pretty calm during most of the year, but it's also a place where people can gather, have different types of events, um, be on a beach. And there was also an idea of creating a pool barge to do a barge that could float from pier to pier. It could go to different communities in Seattle, and you could be uh, on the water, in the water. It also, so that, you know, there's these fantastic views out to the bay, the beautiful sunsets, things like that. There's also this great backwards view to the city where you can get this, this just fantastic view of the skyline. And one of the, so one of the things you see in the background of this image is this, this funky looking structure here. And the reason that is there is um, we have this issue. There's this big bluff in Seattle, and it's, uh, it's a vertical separation that separates the waterfront from other parts of the city by about 100 feet. It's a big drop. 
There's a few rickety stairs that go up there now, and it actually separates a few of Seattle's really important cultural institutions. There's Pike Place Market up at the top, which you probably have heard about, uh, aquarium down below, and the waterfront and the piers below. And so we had this pretty simple idea of just a way to connect these in a pedestrian-friendly way that people in wheelchairs, people can, you know, that, that can walk down, that can come down very easily and get to the waterfront. And so that came, uh, with that came the idea of this overlook walk, a place where people could walk down from Pike Place Market up here. They could come down at a ADA slope down here into an elevator, get down to the waterfront or down to these seating steps here for these views out to the bay. Um, so I'll walk through sort of a, a journey down that. There is first this idea close to um, Pike Place Market that's really centered towards family and kids. It's a place where kids can come and slide down the slopes and sort of interact with this elevation change and places for you know, parents to come and sit and, and watch them do that. Uh, places uh, to sit that are just next to gardens uh, with fantastic views out to the city and the bay. And also places for people to come and picnic and fly a kite and throw a frisbee. And so there's this idea of this larger lawn area that could be up there, a public lawn. And all of this just has these just fantastic views, not only down the waterfront, but out to the bay and out to the port beyond. The last part of this then is the, the seating steps below where there is a um, just a gorgeous view to that that we sort of engineered to align with the summer sunset, so people can come out there and have this great view of the sun setting down the uh, down the mountains beyond. And so that's our that's our vision for the the central public space, this new sort of publicly owned, uh, publicly accessible area that has all of these components that allow people to experience the city, experience the bay, in a variety of different ways, and so. That about sums it up. This is the this is the Seattle waterfront um, today. It's an image of it today, and um, what we're working towards, and whose construction we hope will be finished in 2021, uh, will look like this. So it's a it's been a fantastic project to be involved with. I'm very um, happy to have taken probably extra time to share it with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody have any questions? I know some of you needed to take a quick run out of here. I appreciate your scooting. Um, any questions? It's a really interesting uh, discussion about the financing of projects and the kind of partnerships that we're all dealing with. It's hard to believe that we need to know uh, not only how to do the programming, but also the financing in order to practice successfully today. Yeah, right? I think that that's a that's a really good point. And you know, one of the one of the ways that we have um, stayed in the game with projects like these is there's a lot of people vying to be the um, be in charge and drive the conversation and drive conversation about fees things like that. Is we have you have to be really smart and. We have, uh, we're fortunate to have a number of people at the office that have ex a lot of experience in projects like these and our, one of our main goals is to be at the head of the conversation. So once we get out of that, that head, then we're, we're gone. We have to stay in charge. And so um, on all of the projects that we work on, that's a big, that's a big goal of ours. It's a tough goal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, landscape architect says lead. That's kind of fun. It's a pain yeah, I mean, too, though. Hmm? It's a pain too. <laughs> <laughs>
they raised the level of the city to support all of that. And so um, one of the interesting things that we found out through these environmental impact studies was that um, that actually was a good thing in terms of sea level rise. And so the, um, we were actually talking about this at lunch, that the level of the promenade right now is at um, level 16. And the level of the water is, um, is at least uh, six to seven feet below that. And so they felt that that was adequate um, for the projected sea level rise. Um, did I also hear you ask about transit? Is that right? I'm just trying to think. I was just curious, um, you, I, there was the one study where you, people showed their favorite places on the waterfront, and there was a lot of, um, everyone seemed to densify at the piers, and yeah. they, everyone likes piers. There's also, I think, an interesting design challenge with a pier, though, where it's a dead end, yeah. um, and so from a circulation standpoint, I think it looks like here there's, you've cut some of that down, but were there strategies that you thought about how to make, I mean, everyone likes, loves to get out in the water, but how to make that, have circulation and flow with the project also? That's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, let's see, answer it in maybe using this image. Um, in, terms of, in terms of, so there's really, there's really two piers in this project. There's um, this pier, Pier 6263 and Union Street Pier. And both of these, we've tried to sort of strategically align them with um, streets that are really heavily used to come down to the waterfront. Um, and one of those is um, this street back here, which is it's called Union Street. It's actually one of the primary streets where people come and enter into the waterfront. And we wanted that to be a place that was, um, that could at once sort of w you know, welcome these people down to the waterfront, but also be big enough to hold them to feel like it wasn't necessarily a crowded area, but a place where they, um, where there was some breath, right? And um, it's, it's one of the, these two piers are really w one of the few places on the waterfront where there is that openness and that expanse. The rest of it is, um, it's about 35 feet of promenade and then there's about 35 feet of planting and then um, I don't want to talk about how many feet of roadway. And so we wanted these areas to really feel open and large. Um, and with Pier 6263, um, the, Really, the, the idea for that was it for it also to remain simple, but to, to be on access with this primary sort of pedestrian path down to the waterfront, that this was sort of a, a logical path for people to go to get out to the water. Um, in terms of circulation, um, I think that, you know, what, one of the things that we think about is circulation in terms of the peers from a sort of health and safety standpoint, right? Um, how can we get people out there without it, at night, even without it being lit? How can we keep people um, being hidden, things like that? And so a lot of the interventions that we do, you know, particularly with this pier where we have a condition where it actually slopes down and then slopes up, that we've kept um, that grade separation to be under five feet. So you're still sort of, you know, you're visible. We've also, um, embedded a series of lights into the, the wood benches here, and so that there's light cast down there. Um, and um, in terms of creating sort of a complete circulation, I don't know that that was necessarily a, a big concern of ours, that we wanted, we wanted people to be able to sort of, um, you know, be this procession down out to the waterfront, for them, and then for them to, you know, stay there as long as they want and to be out at the water's edge. Um, and um, and let them experience that. Um, as a new landmark of Seattle, I, I think it will attract a lot of people. So I just wonder how you solve the problem for the parking space. Oh, that's a, you're, we've had so many questions about that in Seattle. It's a good question. Um, there, okay, so can you just go back a couple slides and maybe we can get a better view. Um, that is essentially a roadway issue, right? And what existed before, um, or what exists now, is 
along the roadway, a couple more, along the roadway, um, there was uh, angled parking. And so you would drive in and then you would have um, about 20 feet of a parking space where cars could come in. Now, these guys who own the piers, where people are coming to buy things, they love that. Because more people can come and they can drive there. Um, but we don't love it because it takes away space from the public realm. And so there's a balance there. And one of the ways that we tried to balance that is through, yes, keeping parking, because parking in one way um, helps separate the uh, fast moving cars from people walking. And so we have, for large portions of the site, parallel parking that moves up and down here, but it takes up a little bit less space. The other thing that city is doing from a more strategic standpoint is um, requiring new buildings to open up underground parking garages. In that and so, um, in the example of the should be faster of the area around Pike Place Market, the Overlook Walk, there are a few new uh, buildings that are going in, and one is a building called the Pike Place Market Waterfront Entrance, and it's a building that the Pike Place Market is developing. And as they're developing it, um, there's actually uh, four levels of parking underneath it. And that's to help offset some of the um, some of the issues with parking that, that might be caused. It's a great question. Earlier, you mentioned Atlas Group. Yeah. Right? Um, so you um, submit independently of James Corner um, mm -hmm. your own projects. Mm -hmm. How do you balance? First of all, have time, and second of all, how do you balance and make sure that's not a conflict? Yeah. I'll do the first part first, or the last part first. Um, the types of projects that we pursue at Atlas, they tend to be, um, well, they're categorically projects that the office wouldn't go after. Um, and uh, that's for several reasons. One, because I think the office is better than we are. <laughs> and they obviously have a, you know, a much larger capacity, a much larger talent pool, and things like that. And so um, the, the the projects that we target tend to be um, either very high level um, conceptual projects. Um, an example of that might be the, our, our project in Sacramento, which was really about urban reforestation. It needs to do that and create a little bit of a vision for that, knowing that there, that, that wouldn't develop into a, a real project. And so that, for me, is usually the, a, a boundary, that it stays sort of at a conceptual level. Um, and the other is that they are for smaller projects. And so the project that Jody mentioned is a little sort of installation. And um, in my mind, uh, I think that the, the sort of variety of the types of experiences, it's, it's helped me professionally, um, both at Atlas and at field operations, that um, because of that I have a larger breadth of understanding of um, smaller types of construction um, of really sort of honing skills and developing a, a concept for a project that uh, have both been you know, satisfying personally and yeah, I think useful to the office. Um, nights and weekends is the answer to the first one. <laughs> yeah, so you can, uh, like you burn out here, you can burn out, so you have to, we go in phases. You take breaks every now and again. Good it question. is wonderful though that you, that you do uh, these competitions and that you're, you know, you sort of have a culture of that yeah. surrounding you. It's really great. I'm really fortunate. We're really fortunate at, at Atlas to um, my partner Kim Garza um, that we actually enjoy working together. <laughs> there's very few people where there's been a, um, uh, you know, we butt heads every now and again, but it's just a, it's a pleasure to work with her. And so um, I have to hold on to that as long as I can. We look forward to the future of yeah. Atlas. Uh, anyone else have a last question here? We're getting getting you on the time, so we're we're okay for a few more. If we anybody, or we just round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.